Okay, here we'll start chapter 5 today. And in chapter 5, we will be looking at this very important and long topic of stereochemistry. So let's go ahead and get started. In stereochemistry, one of the first concepts we have to understand is that of chirality. Uh, the word chirality comes from the word kairos, which means hand in Greek. And so here we have a hand. If you take your right hand and put it in front of a mirror, the reflection you would see, or what we call the mirror image, would be your left hand. And your left hand obviously is not the same as your right hand. So we say that if an object produces a mirror image that is different than its original, then that object is chiral. Or what we say it has handedness. Okay? So a right hand glove does not fit the left hand. So an object is chiral if its mirror image is different from its original object. In an achiral, this prefix a means not, so it is not chiral. And so mirror images that can be superimposed, or what we say is identical, that that object is achiral. And an example is that of a chair. If you take the mirror image of the chair, you get the same chair. So if the mirror image is the same, then this original object is achiral. When we apply it to molecules, we then introduce the concept of stereoisomers. And the best way to get introduced to stereoisomers is by looking at enantiomers. Here is the important definition of enantiomers. They are molecules or compounds that are non-superimposable mirror images. And any molecule that is chiral, it must have an enantiomer. So here we see an example. If we take this molecule to bromobutane and focus in on its chiral carbon, and we take its mirror image, we get this here. And if you try to rotate it and put it on top of this one, you would find out that it's different. So these two molecules are enantiomers, non-superimposable, but they are mere images. So let's look at the chiral carbon of a molecule. Okay, so here is the carbon and what we're going to do is have four different groups on it. And if we do and look at its mirror image, we would get this kind of molecule here. We say that a chiral carbon is also what's called an asymmetric carbon because there's no symmetry around this carbon. If I try to draw a plane then both sides of the plane are different, no matter how I would cut across here. So I would not be able to get any symmetry. Okay, this is the result of having a carbon atom bonded to four different groups. And we say that that carbon is therefore chiral. And as a result, its mirror image will be a different compound, which will be called 
and an antimer. We say an asymmetric carbon atom is an example of a chiral center. Chirality or chiral centers belong to an even broader group called stereocenters or sometimes called a stereogenic atom which is any atom at which the interchange of any two groups gives a stereo isomer. So for example if we go back here if I were to interchange any of these two groups say three and four if I were to interchange them then that would produce this molecule here. Okay. So these two molecules are different and they're related by mirror images but another way I could interconvert besides a mirror image is interconvert change any two atoms on bonds and that would convert one to the other. Asymmetric carbons and the double bonded carbon atoms and cis trans are the most common types of stereocenters. Okay, but we'll hold off this cis trans stuff for right now and the double bond. And let's just focus on chiral centers. I don't know why they're calling this chirality centers. It's a misnomer there. Should be chiral centers or chiral carbons. Okay, so this is really bad. Let's scribble that out. So here we have an asymmetric carbon. Why? Because each of these four groups are different from one another. Same thing here. I have four different groups on this nitrogen. Okay. Asymmetric carbons are examples of chiral centers, also called stereocenters. Achiral compounds, note, now I have two of the same groups. Okay, so if I have two or more of the same groups, then its mirror image will be the same. Okay, so if you rotate this, you would find this molecule, which is the same as the original. So always remember that achiral compounds will produce superimposable mirror images, that is, the same mirror images. Okay, so when the images can be superimposed, the compound is a chiral. Planes of symmetry, okay, very important tool in this chapter. If you take this molecule here and I created a plane of symmetry which would be maybe something like this here. Okay. Here's the plane containing these three atoms and this number three would reflect through to that number three. So here doing it on the side you see the reflection. So this molecule would have a plane of symmetry. And any molecule that has a plane of symmetry is a chiral. Okay. Here's another example of a plane of symmetry. So that one side of the molecule is the same as the other side of the molecule. Okay. This plane of symmetry stuff is very important. We're not only going to use it in this chapter, but when we get to organic part two and NMR, we'll be looking at planes of symmetry. If you looked at the trans cyclic compound here, note there is no plane of symmetry. So now 
the molecule is what? Chiral. And so its mirror image will be what? Different. And so I can have a pair of enantiomers. Okay, well, this one here, the chiral carbon is here. Note the four different groups, CH3, NH2, hydrogen, and this group, the acid group. So this is um, one of the amino acids, alanine, which is chiral. So it has a non-superimposable mirror image. So these two are enantiomers. So how do we distinguish between enantiomers? Okay. What we're going to do is use this convention here. And we're going to label carbon atoms, the chiral carbons, as R or S. So how do we do that? What we do is we assign a priority to each group bonded to the chiral carbon. Group 1 will have the highest priority and group 4 will have the lowest priority. Okay, And we base those priorities on atomic numbers. So the higher the atomic number, for example, like iodine, that would have a much higher priority than something like oxygen. Okay, so we prioritize based on atomic number. Here's an example. Note that we take the three-dimensional drawing here that we learned back in chapters one and two. Here are the four different groups. Fluorine has a higher atomic number than nitrogen, which has a higher atomic number than carbon and hydrogen, atomic number of one, will always be number four. Okay. So here we've prioritized them. The key thing we always want to do is have this number four in the back. Remember the back is always designated by this dash line. Okay. So number four always has to be in the back. And then we look at the direction of one to two, to three. Okay, and we see that direction is going like this, which is going counterclockwise. And if it's counterclockwise, we say that it is S. Okay, here's some more examples of uh, this kind of stuff. Okay, in terms of breaking ties and so on. Okay, if you have a double bond to a carbon that it's counted as two times to it or two times to a nitrogen, triple bond, and so on. Okay. So here they're showing that you put number four in the back. And so the R is clockwise and the S is counterclockwise. Okay, so we draw an arrow from the highest to the lowest priority. Okay, so never forget that R is clockwise and S is counterclockwise. Okay, the R means uh, right in uh, Latin and the S means left in Latin. Okay, sinister, that's where that comes from. So here's alanine. Okay, is this R or S alanine? Well, we've prioritized the groups. Nitrogen is the highest priority. 
this carbon second, see that why it is? Because this carbon's bonded, you got a double O and another O, so you got three oxygens here, which beats three hydrogens by a mile. So what direction are we going? One, two, three. So this is the S alanine, isn't it? Here's an example of a molecule that's prioritized, but the number four is in the front. So what we need to do is to rotate it so I get number four in the back. And when I do, I go one, two, and three, where I'm going what this time? Clockwise. And so this molecule would be R, wouldn't it? Look, we got it right. Let's look at this one here. Okay, here I have four different groups. This carbon double bonded to that one, so it's going to carry a little extra priority here. So we got one, two, and three. Four is in the back. So we get the counterclockwise direction to give us the S enantiomer. Let's look at this one here. Here's the chiral carbon. So we're going to draw a three-dimensional picture of it here. So we have a four, one, three, and two. So here's the S enantiomer. And here's the R enantiomer. Okay, so the S enantiomer is found out in nature. The R enantiomer is not found, it has to be made. When we get to cyclic compounds, these things can get a little bit tricky. Okay, here that hydrogen's in the back, so number one priority number two priority, and three. Okay, how did we get those? Well, each of these are carbon atoms, aren't they? But this carbon atom is bonded twice there to that carbon and three, so I got three carbons on this one. This carbon only has one carbon here. This carbon only has one carbon. So that gives me number one. Now let's compare these two. This carbon's bonded to that one, which has what? A carbon with two oxygens. This one's bonded to this one, which would be a carbon bonded to two oxygens with that double bond. And so this gives a higher priority over here. So I'm going counterclockwise for the S carbone here. properties of enantiomers. They have the same boiling and melting points and they have the same density so they have the same physical properties. They have the same refractive index. The only way you can tell the difference between enantiomers is they rotate plane polarized light in equal and opposite directions. Okay. So here's an introduction to what polarized light is. If I have a light source and I shine it through a polarizer, okay, so here are the different waves of the light. It goes through the polarizer. Only one of those waves gets through that we call plain polarized light. So now if I set it up, the plain polarized light comes through. If I now have a molecule or a chamber of molecules that are chiral, they will rotate this plane polarized light to come out in so many degrees. We say that a positive or a clockwise rotation is dextrorotatory and a negative or a counterclockwise rotation is levorotatory. Okay? Note that these are not related to whether the molecule is R or S. Okay? 
So an R could be positive or negative, and an S could be positive or negative. How do you tell? You have to do the experiment and put it in the polarizer. Okay, and that angle of rotation is what's called the specific rotation. That depends on the length of the tube, the concentration, optical activity, temperature, and wavelength of light. Okay, here's just a salt problem. We won't deal with that. Okay biological discrimination, your body can discriminate between uh, enantiomers such as an epinephrine. Your body can use the R enantiomer but it doesn't recognize the S enantiomer. Here's an important definition of racemic mixtures. Okay, a racemic mixture is one that contains equal amounts of two enantiomers. Okay, so here is the S and the R to butanol. If I have a 50 50 mixture of them, that is called a racemic mixture. The important result of a racemic mixture is they cancel the optical activity out of each other and so we get an alpha value equal to zero for a racemic mixture. Optical purity okay, is sometimes called enantiomeric excess where one enantiomer is present in greater amounts. Okay, won't get into that too much here. Okay, here's the chair confirmation of uh, cis 12 dibromocyclohexane. Okay. And their conversion is so fast that makes the molecules in equilibrium. So in an essence, uh, even though the two molecules are enantiomers, they are present in equal amounts and so make them optically inactive. Here's a way to prevent that inner conversion. And so uh, these two molecules would be chiral and unable to interconvert. Okay, here's alanine, even though it doesn't have a chiral carbon, uh, the molecule's chiral because its mirror image is non-superimposable, and these two are unable to interconvert. Talking about Fisher projections, okay, Fisher projections such as here, where the horizontal has the atoms coming out and the vertical dashes they're going behind. Okay. So here's an example. Okay. Here this is the S enantiomer. How can I tell that? Well, number four here is on horizontal. I really need to have four on the vertical because those are going behind. Since it's on the horizontal, I'll look at the priorities. One, two, and three. So these are going, what, clockwise. But when I have number four on the horizontal, I always take the opposite which would be what? Counterclockwise. And so that makes this the S enantiomer. Okay. So here's some rules. Okay. Just won't 
pay attention to those. Those aren't real important. But just be able to uh, tell if the molecule is R or S. Here again, the hydrogen is on the horizontal. So here's one, two, and three. So this is going what? S. But I take the opposite, so this would be an R enantiomer. Here we look at uh, Fisher projections in terms of mirror images. Okay, These are easy to draw and make it easier to find enantiomers and internal mirror planes or planes of symmetry when the molecule has two or more chiral centers. Okay. Here, this carbon is S. Let's figure out why. Here, the hydrogen, again, is horizontal. So I'll need to take the opposite. So chlorine is 1. The carbon, carbon tie. But this carbon has chlorine and a carbon. So this would be 2. And this carbon here would be 3. So 1, 2, 3, clockwise. But I take the opposite. And so I get S. This one is S down here as well. Again, hydrogen's horizontal, so I'll take the opposite. So 1, 2, and 3. So that's going what? Clockwise. But i got to take the opposite. And so it gives me S for counterclockwise. Okay, move on from the double bonds. Okay, here they introduce the topic of diastereomers. Okay, so remember what diastereomers are? These are molecules that are non mirror images, non superimposable, but yet they have the same molecular formula. So here's an example of two diastereomers here. Okay, where these are obviously not mirror images, but they are the same molecular formula. They're stereoisomers. Here's a better view of some diastereomers. Okay, so these two are enantiomers, mirror images, and not the same. These two are enantiomers mirror images and not the same. But if I compare this one here with this one here, those would be diastereomers. They're not mirror images. Same thing with these two, diastereomers. Same thing with these two, diastereomers. Same thing with these two, diastereomers. Okay, so they're molecules with two or more chiral carbons, and stereoisomers are not mirror images. When compounds have two or more chiral carbons, they can have enantiomers, diastereomers, or even what are called the meso compounds. Okay, a meso compound is where it has an internal plane of symmetry with it. Enantiomers have opposite configurations at each corresponding chiral carbon. Diastereomers have some matching and some opposite configurations. And again, the key here, mesos have internal mirror planes. Remember the way to count the number of stereoisomers is 2 to the n, where n is the number of chiral carbons. Okay, so here's some definitions. Remember, constitutional or structural isomers. Or you can have stereoisomers, which can be broken down to diastereomers and enantiomers. 
Meso compounds have an internal mirror plane. See those there? And if they have an internal mirror plane, that means what? They are achiral. And so their mirror images would be the same. Okay, here's the 2n rule. So I have two chiral carbons, so 2 to the n would be 2 squared, which would be 4. So there's a total of 4 stereoisomers. But two of them are what? Mesos, right? Internal mirror planes, so these two are the same. So I can cross one off. So here there would be a total of 3 stereoisomers. So I always subtract one if I have a meso. Okay, diastereomers, opposite of enantiomers, they do have physical properties and so can be separated. Louis Pasteur uh, was the first to discover uh, chiral compounds and able to separate them. He did them by a more tedious process, but this, he, this is where it all starts with him. Back in 1848, where he used a microscope and a pair of tweezers to physically separate the enantiomeric crystals. And so accomplished the first artificial resolution of enantiomers. Okay. And today there's other ways to do the resolution by chemical reactions that we won't get into here. You can also separate enantiomers using chromatography, okay, where I have a packing column that is chiral, and so it can allow one enantiomer to be separated from the other.